Social Security provides a foundation of retirement security for everyone that we all pay into, we all benefit from. And then most of us want to save more on top of that. Not everyone's able to, right? But if you're not able to, at least you have that foundation. But if you are able to, you can save into a 401k or IRA and have a lot more money to retire on. This is kind of a similar model and where everyone pays in. We all have a foundation of long-term care security. And if you want more, um, you can get more. Hey, y'all, this is Costa. And today I'm here with my guest, Ben Vecti director of the Washington Cares Fund, the nation's first universal long-term care insurance program located in Washington state. Today, we're talking about the universal need for universal long-term care. So for anyone who isn't familiar, will you tell us about the Washington State Cares Fund and your role as director? Sure, and thank you, Costa. It's great to be here with you. I'm excited to talk about this important subject. So the Washington Cares Fund is the first of its kind in the United States, although similar programs exist in Germany and the Netherlands, Japan, and many other countries. And it basically, it takes the model of Medicare uh, and implements it for long-term care. Now, Medicare is medical care for older adults and people with disabilities. And what the Washington Cares Fund is, is financed in a similar way as Medi uh, Medicare hospital insurance, where you pay in out of every paycheck over the course of your career, a small amount, about a half a percent of what you earn. So for the typical worker in our state, that's about $24 a month they pay in. And when you're older, or if you have an accident or illness uh, over the course of your life and you need long-term care, you have access to $36,500 that you can use as you see fit to purchase long-term care services and supports to help you uh, remain in your own home as you deal with your long-term care challenges. And now that amount of money is annual, or is that just the, for your entire life? So lifetime. that is for your entire life. It's, it's not designed to, to address all of everyone's need. Okay. It's, a, it's a modest premium and a, for a modest benefit. The right. policymakers in our state uh, made a calculation that people that this, the people would be roughly prepared to pay about a half a percent into a fund like this. Sure. Um, and they could have had the premium four times as high and the benefit four times as high, uh, but they wanted to start with a modest premium, modest, modest benefit. And then if people want to purchase additional private insurance, they're able to. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so what does your day to day look like being director? It's exciting. You know, we are studying uh, the, uh, the, pr the problems that Washingtonians face in this regard, trying to understand them as best we can. So as we design our program, we're meeting their needs. Um, we're working to make sure that we develop a a network of long-term care providers, whether it's home care mm -hmm. aides or uh, institutional providers or ramp builders, you know, people sure. who do grab bars in the bathroom, all the different services and supports that people need. Yeah. We're working to make sure that there's a pipeline for that in our state because, as you well know, the population 85 or older is doubling over the next 15 years, yeah. and more and more people are going to need these services. So what we do is part of the solution, which is have a financing mechanism that helps everyone afford it. But the other part of this is actually having enough people who are offering these services, the workers, the other yeah. service providers, because otherwise there'll be a big shortage in 10 or 15 years for these kinds of workers. And that would drive up the price of these services and also create access issues. So we're working on all of those, all of those issues. Yeah. And so it's interesting because, you know, you would think that being a director of the fund, you're just going to focus on kind of the financials and making sure that you have the, the means to be able to make this fund successful. But really, it's about building the foundation for Washington State, uh, because you're right. If you, you can have as much money as you want, but if there's not people there to provide the service, then it doesn't matter. You're still at square one, right? It, particularly in rural areas. You know, yeah. they, my, my dad lives in upstate New York, and he had uh, an issue once where he needed support, and the nearest person was a 45-minute drive away who, could, who was wow. available. Mm -hmm. So that's, that would be hard to have on, uh, if someone had to come three times a week. You know, that becomes very expensive to pay for the transportation for that person, and they may not even be willing to come at all. And we have a lot of rural areas in our state, and as, as most states do, and so we want to make sure that we're prepared that this benefit not only is available to people, but also meets meaningful to them. I want to touch on this very briefly, but how did you get into this line of work? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, most of us have, almost all of us have care stories in our families, right? Sure. 
Yes. Um, and my my mom had Parkinson's, and so I was very close to her and accompanied her on that long journey wow. um, through the various stages that you go through, and starting to need assistance at home and redoing the bathroom to put grab bars in and lower the rim between the, the floor of the bathroom and actually entering the yep. shower, um, removing obstacles that she might trip or fall over, eventually bringing someone in to help cook for her so that she wouldn't uh, you know burn herself or hurt herself yep. in the kitchen. And all of those stages, and finally she she went into an assisted living facility and then uh, nursing home wing and hospice. So all of that made me realize that we what people really need as they age is dignity and, and mm-hmm. independence. No one wants to lose their independence prematurely. I mean, sometimes you have to go to an institutional setting um, uh, eventually, but most of us would prefer to stay either at home or in an adult family home uh, where they're living with other adults who are in a similar situation Mm -hmm. as long as possible. And the other part of it is the dignity aspect, right? It, to the extent that you can be empowered to have a home care aid, or in our state, you can sure. even pay a family member to take care of you. That mm-hmm. enables you to have control over your life at a time when you're losing control over so many things. And right. that's, that inspired me to want to go into this area to give more people that kind of dignity and independence as they age. So I got to ask, all right, so the payroll tax is the primary funding source for this program, right? The only funding source. The The only only funding funding source. source. And And it's a very modest tax for a very modest benefit, like you said. Collectively, though, why are we so apprehensive about paying for other people's care? That's a great question. I think... You know, I think we didn't always, it wasn't always this way. You know, we enacted Social Security in the 1930s, which created yeah. the, you know, created what we now call retirement. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, before exactly. that, it, most people weren't able to ever retire. Um, right. It made it, before that, people always had to move in with their kids when they got older. Yeah. Um, so, uh, which was not great for the parents or the kids in most cases, I would, I would assume. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I think that over the last few decades, we've become more and more individualistic in our society. And uh, and I think especially during the pandemic, people started to get afraid of a lot of things. So many, there's so much change in the world that right. uh, pe- people have uh, kind of tortoised back into their <laughs> shell, you know, um, and our, you know, we have cameras outside our houses and we're, we're kind of, you know, um, reluctant to partake in community the way we maybe were over most of American history. And so we hope that this is, in our state, it's a first step to help make it easier for people to be part of a community and solve this problem together. Because individually, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to provide for this completely individually. Let me give you a a metaphor for that, which is Social Security and 401k plans. So Social Security provides a foundation of retirement security for everyone that we all pay into, we all benefit from. And then most of us want to save more on top of that. Not everyone's able to, right? But if you're not able to, at least you have that foundation. Mm -hmm. But if you are able to, you can save into a 401k or IRA and have a lot more money to retire on. This is kind of a similar model and where everyone pays in. We all have a foundation of long-term care security. And if you want more, um, you can get more. And we think it's a good balance between the role of the public sector and the private mm-hmm. sector, just like with our retirement system. Um, a foundation of security that we all pay, pitch into together, and then the rest um, you can do on your own. But you know, we don't know. No one knows ahead of time what their long-term care costs are going to be. Correct. Seven in ten of us have some need. It might be a $20,000 need, a $30,000 need, or it could be a $500,000 need. You just don't know. And insurance is a very efficient way of dealing with things like that. Um, kind of like with retirement. You know, I don't know if I'm going to live to be 60 or 80 or 100, right? Um, and so I don't know how much to save for retirement. The great thing about Social Security is it gives you a, a fixed amount of money every month until you pass away. So you have a degree of security throughout your life, no matter how long you live. Um, for long-term care, um, Walk Cares gives you a, f- a foundation of security. And I think people are starting to become more aware that that's necessary. Absolutely. And so here's... Um I don't, I don't really think it's a controversial question, but it, it's somewhat complicated. So you have auto insurance that's mandated if you want to drive a car. You have very close, I mean, obviously it's been repealed, but the original intent was that health insurance would be also be mandated. So why not mandate long-term care insurance? Yeah, 
that's an interesting question. Um, it's an interesting question, and it's a philosophical one, which I, um, I'm not a philosopher, <laughs> so I won't try to answer it. But I would say that um, uh, uh, I would say that if you don't protect yourself, so for mm-hmm. example, my father, a very individualistic, independent, strong man. Um, mm-hmm. Many people like that all across our country who think <laughs> that if you work hard and you're tough. You will be able to do everything on your own, right? But there comes a time in almost everyone's life when that changes, and you can't yeah. predict when it's going to happen. And for my dad, he fell down the stairs. You know, um, somebody. Came, my mom got a, a diagnosis, um, and it happens to seven in ten of us. And so, when that does happen, the, if you don't prepare for that, it doesn't mm-hmm. just affect you, and it's hard for you in that situation. But, but it not only affects you; it affects your children, your spouse. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that when, it, when something happens to a parent, the kids have to get together and figure out what are we going to sure. do? Right. Do we pitch in financially? Do we take turns <laughs> taking care of him or her, mom or dad? Who takes so, nights, right? Right. And so I think it's really important that we realize kind of, you, the, what you're implying there is true, which is that they're just like with the reason why people are required to have car insurance is so that if you do hit someone else, right. that that person isn't isn't a, you know a victim of the fact that you didn't prepare. Right. You could make the same argument for long-term care insurance. But it's it's and we'll we'll definitely have that discussion in the future. But right, for right now, what are the unique advantages that only long-term care? You know, I'm sorry, that only universal long-term care coverage brings to the United States and our future generations. Yes, that's a great question because the there's a magic to uh, universal programs like this, which is that it solves the problem that, that private voluntary insurance has. So voluntary insurance, whether it's private or public, has a core problem, which is adverse selection, which means that um, let's say um, – Let's look at private long-term care insurance. The average premium nationwide, according to the latest data, is $2,700 a year. And those premiums, mm-hmm. they start out lower when, if you buy it when you're younger, and they go up higher as you get older, typically. And the reason that's so expensive is because the average age at which people buy long-term care insurance is age 60, because most that's people great. just don't think about it until yeah. they get older. And they start to feel their own mortality, and then they see their parents going through things, and that's when they buy. And so the not only do they have fewer years over which to – uh, spread the the cost of the of financing their benefits, the premiums higher. But the other part of it is that the uh, to make money, a private insurance company um, only wants to sell to people who are unlikely to need long term care. That's mm-hmm. the way insurance works. If like with if car insurance, if I have a few car accidents, I'll pay a much higher premium than if I have a good driving record. Well. For long-term care, if I'm an insurance company and I see that someone has a history of dementia in their family or they have diabetes, I probably won't cover them at all because Mm -hmm. um, there's a high risk that we would face a high claim down the road. And so private long-term care insurance is a good solution for people who can afford it, but only about 7 to 10% of people can afford that because the premiums continue after you retire um, until the day you die or need care. if you drop your coverage at 85 and you stop paying in, you lose your private insurance coverage. And then if at 89 you need long-term care, you don't have it. So you really have to pay till the day you die or need care. Most Americans on a fixed income in retirement can't afford to pay $2,700 a year uh, for their own, plus maybe the same for their spouse. It's just not affordable for most people. So with public universal long-term care insurance, we all pay in kind of like Social Security or Medicare from your first job, you know, collecting tickets at the movie theater, you know, at age 15 uh, until your last sure. job. You pay in a little bit out of every paycheck. And then, um, and then because of that, because everyone's in the same risk pool, there is no adverse selection where the, the riskier people, um, you know, only only people who think they're going to need it buy it. Um, you end up with healthy people, sick people, young people, old people, all in the same risk pool, which means that we, as a plan, can lower the keep low premiums for everyone, um, and the risk gets averaged out over the whole population. That's fascinating. So I look at cost plans all the time, and they are much higher than $36,000 a year annually. Um, And so I'm curious, in in turn, you were talking about the affordability and also the access issues that face long-term care services. So two questions. First, how does the Washington Cares Fund address those affordability and access issues? 
given that you know you only get the thirty six thousand, which I understand is just a foundation, but still I'm interested. But also, I, I want to know just from your perspective, given that you've been doing this for so long and you've been so kind of boots on the ground and engaged with this problem, why is it so prevalent and persistent in 2023? And which particular problem are you referring to? Well, the one about affordability and access in terms of yeah. long-term care services. Yeah, I think because you know Americans, most Americans uh, aren't prepared for retirement to begin with. Right. The typical household approaching retirement ha- has you know less than fifty thousand dollars saved uh, in their four hundred one k or I- in IRAs mm-hmm. for retirement savings. You know that that's not enough to. That's only about a three hundred dollar a month annuity if you bought an annuity at sixty five. Um, right. And so, the, not only do most people not have enough money to retire on, then there's health care costs that are higher in retirement, and long term care costs are on top of all of those expenses. Right. So, yeah. I think we all struggle to pay our bills. You know, if our kids go to college, that's very expensive. Um, it's expensive to live. It's expensive to raise children, and it's just hard to save money uh, for most people. And so, it's just something it's hard to prepare for, which is why it's. Great to have a program like walk is in place where you don't have to think about it. It's kind of like Medicare. I mean, imagine mm-hmm. if we didn't have Medicare um, and Pete and you got older, you know, two thirds of the population wouldn't have access to health care in retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, think how dramatic that would be for people who get cancer or have other health problems. So it's, it's, it's great to have something else that you don't have to think about that you're automatically paying into, but it'll be there for you when you need it. W- will this end up being a is the long-term goal of, of the Washington Cares Fund to allow for long-term care to be covered by Medicare? Is that, is that somewhat of the long-term goal? Like if we can prove that this model works, then maybe we can implement or raise maybe somewhat of the, of the Medicare tax, and then we can start offering long-term care to all Americans as a benefit of Medicare as opposed to just, you know, state by state, similar to how it's run now in, in the Medicaid system. Right, right. I mean, we don't. We certainly don't have any any specific uh, agenda or goals as a program about that. But okay. I think a lot of the people who were behind uh, this program originally, and you know, advocates around the country, AARP and others, care deeply as do you and I about the the problems that families face when a loved one needs long term care when they have dementia right. or, and so the um, I think that it would make sense to do this on a national level for a lot of reasons. It would make it easier for private insurance companies to offer supplemental private coverage because there would be the same program everywhere and then they could duck yeah. onto that. Sure. Um, it would make it easier for people who to, to plan as they move across states. Employers would know that it's the same everywhere and make it easier for them if they wanted to offer some supplemental employer, uh, employee benefit, they could. So I think that definitely makes sense. Um, and if we do, and, and, and we will be successful, and, if, and when we are... Right. Um, I think you're going to see other states move. California is very close to doing something nice. uh, like we're doing. Um, several other states are also considering similar things. And I think in te- 10 years from now, you'll see two or three other states doing this. And 20 years from now, there'll be something at the federal level. I don't know if it has to be through Medicare. It could be. You could also do a standalone program. There's pros and cons to different ways of doing it. But some way, we need to get there. So you've been the Washington Cares Fund has been around for how long now? Four years? It's, well, it was enacted in 2019. Um, okay, so we start collecting years. premium. We start collecting premiums this summer, and okay. we start paying benefits three years from now. Okay. So, is it is it too long of a time to wait 20 years for a federal policy to come into place because of the because of the urgency yeah. with regards to so many people aging? And, it is the absolutely it's too long. Yeah, you know, I used yeah. to work in, in D.C., so I'm just being realistic about how slowly <laughs> things move there. You're a um, professional. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it takes a while, and, and it, it takes a while for uh, in Washington D.C. for uh, people to be to 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 make a big change like that. Yeah. But you're right; the demographics are changing now. Um, in the next 15 years, doubling of the page, uh, population 85 or older. So, mm-hmm. sure, it would be great if we move sooner. It, it could happen sooner. I, I hope it does. Yeah. So, the Washington Cares Fund helps to confront the current long-term care workforce shortage, and it supports care providers. Could this program change the infrastructure of how we provide and receive care? You know, absolutely. It's, you know, any financing mechanism, you know, whether it's Medicaid or Medicare or, or our program, 
uh, when you bring a lot of new revenue into an industry or system, yeah. it creates a sort of capital investment opportunities to invest in new systems, new types of providers. It incentivizes new businesses to form, uh, to enter the space, and it creates opportunities for leveraging innovation to do things more efficiently. So if I were a, a, a provider of long-term care in our state right now, I would be planning for this and making investments to, uh, to, to scale up, to be prepared to meet the sure. demands of our new population. So, and we're also seeing, you know, we're on the West Coast here with Seattle as a high-tech city. You know, we have a lot of, you know, Silicon Valley is on, this, on our coast as well. As you all know, there's so much innovation happening in the health space. Um, with new, new apps and assistive devices and things that mm -hmm. measure and report out your health status, uh, EKG readings and diabetes and blood pressure and all those types of things. So um, hopefully we'll see innovations here, which mean that you don't solely have to rely on long-term care workers, but you have other devices which can maybe um, mitigate the worker shortage that we're going to have Absolutely. in this area with some technology as well. And I truly believe that, and it's not just because like I'm just like a millennial, but I truly believe that <laughs> the technological applications um, of sensors and passive monitoring and um, you know be it you know two way communications via iPads, um, though all of those things are going to be necessary to remove some of the human element and not just for multi-generational homes where families are caring for other family members, but like for you know companies like myself and others that are in the space that are providing services, there's just not enough people that want to participate as a caregiver as a profession and make right. a career of it. So we have to have tech, tech applications to be able to remove the human element and still be able to adequately provide quality care and scale those services. Absolutely. So. I mean, if I had if I had you know ten million dollars, I would be investing in this kind of type of stuff because, I mean, as you say, you, you highlighted a really interesting one, which is the two-way iPad communication. Mm -hmm. that, that's useful both for um, uh, if I have a, a long-term care worker, a social worker, say, or a nurse coming to the home, they they could then liaise with a doctor uh, mm -hmm. if necessary, right? That is part of a service. That's a great feature. We know it, how destabilizing it is for people with dementia if they have to move around a lot and leave the home and go to a, a, a hospital or go to a doctor's office and then come back. Uh, the, those kinds of changes in, in environmental setting are destabilizing. The other aspect of it is just monitoring. For example, mm -hmm. I was living in Washington, D.C. My mom was in Florida. Um, it would have been terrific if I could have had a camera in her living room to see her move around the house to see if she'd slipped and fallen, for example, sure. right? Or Absolutely. is she struggling to get by the furniture? Is she leaving the stove on? Um, um, that yeah. kind of thing. So I do think those are just some simple examples, um, but there, there's a lot of potential in this space. So there is, it, it takes it even a step further. And I, and I know that we don't need to spend this entire podcast talking about tech, but we're almost towards the end and I feel like we should give it some credence. There is applications now where there's a sensor on, say for example, a chair right or let's just say it's a bed so in the middle of the night somebody gets out of bed as soon as they get out of bed because there's a sensor on the bed lights come on and they light their way to a bathroom yes. and then then a sensor comes on and a, and a hallway camera comes on so it, it's never on unless they pass the sensor and then here's the here's the part that, that is very interesting on an app you're monitoring the movement of your mom wow but instead of her going back to bed, she decides, I'm not tired. It's, you know, I've, I've slept enough. I'm going to go watch some TV in the living room. So you get a chair pad sensor that automatically states or that automatically shows that your mom is not in her bed. She's in her chair she's watching TV. You know the TV's on. So, like, there's so many applications that you can have to remove the human element. And, fit, and here's, the, here's the kicker. Fit into that benefit that you guys have right, and it actually right. pay for the services because for a and this is me like living in the future i feel like somewhat like elon musk right now so just don't hold it against <laughs> me um <laughs> you could have like an adt call center almost providing response teams when when there's an emergency but also just primarily providing remote monitoring all working on an algorithm and all somebody has to do is spend five thousand dollars on a package 
That's a great idea. That's it. I'm sold. I'll invest in your in your time. <laughs> Give me the thirty Thanks. second pitch. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. And because you know it is kind of inefficient. Otherwise, so the way we've always done this is kind of inefficient because I know I saw it with my own mom. Like often, yeah. you have to have someone there for four to eight hours a day right. just in case something happened. Right. right. Most of the time, right. they were just sitting next to her on the couch watching TV yeah. with her. Providing so, companionship. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is a more efficient way for sure. Yeah. So. Why is it so important that other states consider implementing similar programs for universal long-term care? Because, because with the aging of the population, there's a couple things that have changed significantly that make this a mm-hmm. new crisis. One is the aging of the population we've talked about. So mm-hmm. the, 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 whatever problems we're seeing now are going to get twice as bad over the next 10 years because of aging, because more and more people are going to be in their 80s. Right. Um, the other part of it that we don't talk about hardly at all, but has happened to kind of invisibly in the last few decades is that the the stay-at-home caregiver has virtually disappeared from our society, right? Mm-hmm. In the 50s and 60s, you had a lot of families who would have one partner at home, usually it was the woman, and they, she was taking care of the parents, the husband's parents, the kids, and, and aunts and uncles occasionally, like all of that. That no, that's rare. I mean, less than ten percent of households have a stay-at-home caregiver anymore, because you people have to work in order to make ends meet. Right. And so, because of those two phenomena, phenomena, um, when when a long-term care need hits now, uh, and it hits much more frequently than it used to, it can devastate a family's finances. Mm-hmm. It can, and it's not just the finances. Also, psychologically, when children become the parent, and parent becomes a child, this reversal of the of the relationships we all grew up with can be really jarring for a family. It's mm-hmm. much better for the families in our states if they can. Spend the older years of the parent as a companion, talking with them, spending meaningful time together, instead right. of having to provide long-term care to their own parents. Right. And so I think all the states across our country, because we all care about our families, should be concerned about protecting our families from being really um, hurt by, the, by being unprepared to, to cope with this challenge. Absolutely. So we always like to end the show with a call to action. What's the most critical piece of advice you'd share with someone as they begin to plan for long-term care? That's a great question. I think people underestimate the uh, how expensive long-term care can be mm-hmm. and what a, what a crisis it represents for a family when the need hits. Um, it can be, like I said, a, a, a diagnosis, which is traumatic for a family. It can be falling. My dad fell down the stairs and ended up in the ER, almost passed away from the fall itself. Yeah. When that happens, it happens in an instant, the diagnosis yeah. or the fall, and suddenly everything is transformed. And at that moment, you need money. You need a, a good deal of money immediately to prevent uh, your, 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 your situation can deteriorate quickly if you don't get the care immediately. You could fall again the next day. You could mm-hmm. end up going to the ER and never leave the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so having money for through a program like WACARES or in, in other states that don't have WACARES, it could be private insurance, having that available so that when the need strikes, you can respond immediately and get a home care aid in place, for example, so that things don't get worse is really important for the individual who needs the care and it also gives the family time to catch their breath and develop a plan. Like our benefit isn't going to solve all of everyone's needs, but it gives you about a year for the kids to come together and the spouse, if the spouse is still alive, and and figure out what is our plan for after this right. year. But for the yeah. first year, you're, you've got some security. And so if, I would say, you know, either, you know, try to get a program like this in your own state. And if you can't, just make sure that you have some money available so that you're not caught off guard. 